the, bilater the, the special relationship, by the way, is, is really active and existing in intelligence, in nuclear, and in, in basically in defense. But uh, I mean, with Trump, everything is possible and not possible. Uh, would you have this? Uh, yeah, maybe I can have the commanding joystick here. What I try to do is to analyze the political dynamics of European politics. Uh, what is, can we say anything in general about what goes on? Uh, and uh, I've chosen to call it polarization, that there is a dynamic of polarization between East and Western Europe. Uh, a polarization clearly within Britain within France, and also a fra process of fragmentation in many, uh, particularly West European democracies, and that has to do with identity politics or the new tribalism, as it's often called, but it also has to do with populism. Uh, so in a way, this sounds like a terrible menu, uh, a la carte menu of politics, and I will try to substantiate what I mean by this. Uh, and um, this one, okay, okay. So if we start by Europe, situating Europe in the um, uh, in the neighbourhood, Europe is in many ways home alone. This is the <laughs> Christmas movie you've all seen. Uh, the boy in the nice, rich neighbourhood is home alone, and uh, people are trying to break into his house. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that we have now very clear evidence of Russian revisionism in the neighborhood. That is uh, Georgia 2008, when um, two parts of Georgia were basically occupied by Russia to stop NATO uh, membership for uh, Georgia. And this is true for Ukraine today, where Crimea is annexed and Donbas uh, is in a sort of simmering conflict, on and off conflict, also in order to stop um, expanding Western organizations. So this is clear, and this is where we should have had a clear European lead in reacting, in deterring, in sanctioning, and so on. And what we find, uh, I wrote a book about the, this last, uh, published last year, what I find is that it's the Americans that lead in everything to do with uh, deterrence and, um, and sanctions. And the Europeans are followers. And this is, I think, problematic. 74 years after World War II, it is not the Europeans that lead themselves or defend themselves. And in the illegal mass migration case, which was often said to be a migration shock, and it was a shock politically, with big consequences for populist parties, uh, also here, the Europeans didn't really know what to do. And it ended, it ended so far by outsourcing the problem to Erdogan, to thugs in Libya, uh, to really absolutely substandard regimes that one would normally not deal with. And this is the EU, and it is Germany as the key actors. Also something unexpected, given the values of Europe. So there has been no... Uh, policy of sustainable management, so to speak, on the migration issue, and that issue continues to feed into public opinion and support for populist parties. I just want to cite some statistics. Uh, in, in note two, I have, in uh, note three, I have cited them. Eurobarometer 2018 shows that immigration and terrorism, and the two are then conflated sometimes, they are the top items for people, when you ask people, what are the key issues for you? It's not the job, it's not job, it's not sort of normal politics anymore, it's these issues. Chatham House Survey 2017, eight of 10 European states, in majorities in these states oppose further Muslim immigration. So the fear of the Muslim, clearly documented. And even in Germany, 53% agree to this. And then we have British data showing that for the last 16 years, the fear of migration or immigration 
uh, this, the view that immigration is a major problem has risen from 7 to 49 percent. So wherever you look at uh, empirical data, you find this, uh, this uh, preoccupation with migration. Terrorism is, of course, uh, an unrelated, basically unrelated issue, but it is a cross-border issue, uh, and uh, it, uh, it requires uh, vi vigilance, intelligence, knowledge of who, who crosses borders. Terrorism will continue. Uh, there will be ISIL attacks in Europe. Christians, Jews will be targets for much of this, if possible. Uh, the West in general. So Europe has a problem uh, that will continue. Now, we should expect that Europeans now would say we must stand united, we must have common policies, we must cooperate. What happens in this period of time? Instead, we get more and more problems in Europe. Europeans creating their own problems, one could say, but I think we see a polarization of political values and views, East, West in Europe, and as I said, a fragmentation inside West European states. There is a revolt against elites over migration, as I mentioned. Uh, there is the Brexit division in Britain and the divisiveness of Brexit, EU, Britain, is amazing. There should be a win-win. Brussels should say, let's find a good solution to this. We need you and you need us. A pragmatic economic solution. Instead, the, there is a spat of vilification almost across the channel. Not only the British tabloids, but comments by Juncker, comments by Verhofstadt, uh, comments, of course, by British politicians. Uh, that are really childish, are really destructive, unnecessary. So there is something about the lack of quality to the political discourse that is very disconcerting. Then there is the third problem of tribalism. What is that? Maybe not the right word. It's uh, talked about as tribalism. Identity politics that undermine uh, citizenship of equal citizens. This is very much a US, Western European problem, has to do with anthropology, with uh, um, ontology, with the lack of an, a, a common understanding of human nature. It is no longer, there's no longer a common understanding of citizens as being, having an equal human nature, and I will get to that towards the end. Uh, so we have this uh, amazing number of sort of this uh, sort of uh, unpleasant political facts in Europe. Um, and in France, uh, it is amazing that the streets demand this or that, and the streets get it, that uh, the president has to address in a way, uh, he has to find a sort of desperate kind of a way to address uh, people's protests. And of course, the French are very good at protesting. That's uh, sort of a, a, a profession among university professors often in, at the Sorbonne. I have students who go there who never get any papers because they cannot do any exams because of all the demonstrations. But I mean, Macron, uh, he faces uh, permanent, permanent uh, street demonstrations that are violent. And this is, uh, in a way, where are the representative structures of government in this picture? Let's start then to try to analyze populism. What is that? Populism uh, is, of course, a term that is uh, used uh, as, a, as a kind of vilification. If you don't like your opponent, he's a po populist. So populism is used as a label. And we have many examples of that. We had Hillary Clinton calling uh, Trump's voters deplorables. Uh, they are populist, they are deplorables. I have a quote from The Economist calling the Tory party now a party of populist nationalism, which is amazing. <laughs> the Economist would write that. I mean, it clearly isn't, isn't true. Uh, and populism uh, becomes then very difficult to use as an analytical descriptive term. 
Populism is defined by a scholar who is the, perhaps the foremost one, Cas Muddy. He is from uh, the Netherlands. He says, most scholars use populism as a set of ideas focused upon the opposition between the people, the good people, the real people, and the elite, the bad people. But apart from this, uh, it isn't uh, an issue problem. We have left-wing populist, Hugo Chavez, good example, and right-wing populist. Um, I would say Donald Trump is a foremost example of populism. Maybe we shouldn't put that in the conclusions to the workshop, but the method used uh, is the same. It is, I speak for the people, the people are forgotten, or the people are, are downtrodden, and so on, and the elites, uh, the sump in Washington, or the elites are destroying uh, the, um, uh, the democracy, and real democracy is direct democracy, not indirect. Uh, and this undoubtedly is fueled by, uh, as I said, the migration issue more than by economic concerns. Let me just quote uh, some data on this. Uh, on, um, uh, uh, we, fi we find that uh, the economic issues are not uh, the key ones, although they in a way ought to be. I'll just find uh, where this is, yes. We have Joseph Stieglitz, who was here uh, last, at our last plenary, who has shown how the working class buying power in the US has, uh, not, if not declined, stagnated. Uh, we have a new study in world politics by Hope and Martelli, finding that income inequality under globalization has risen tremendously, uh, especially in the US and the UK. And then we have uh, a study of Brexit voting, uh, which shows that um, uh, by Hobolt, a female uh, scholar, and she says that uh, the divide between winners and losers of globalization was a key driver of the vote. And she says um, the EU, EU's effect on the economy and migration are highly correlated in the voters' choice. Uh, concluding, and she has surveyed all the empirics on the vote in Britain. Uh, Britain is now, quote, a deeply divided country, not only along class, education, and generational lines, but also in terms of geography, north, south. So uh, clearly the economy, yes, but uh, this migration factor uh, definitely as well. And that's why right-wing populism is, uh, is so prominent in Europe today to the extent that even <coughs> social democratic parties imitate their positions on migration. The Danish shows social democrats that are, uh, there's elections in Denmark now, and that party has now adopted all of the right-wing views of migration. <coughs> so we have this uh, um, problem of uh, populist method and a particular kind of issue that drives populism in Europe. Now, uh, it is important, and that's a main point, to divide, to, to distinguish between populism as a method and the real issues underlying uh, voters' concerns. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, uh, uh, sort of deplorables talk about those who voted for Brexit, as if they were stupid. Uh, those who are concerned about migration, as if they are racist. Uh, I mean, the whole, there's a, there, there is a true elite uh, sort of disdain for the ordinary voters in many respects. And uh, as I quote scholars who write on particularly migration, they say if vote, if, if states cannot control their own borders, not meaning closing them, but control them, then of course uh, <clears throat> right-wing populists will ensure that that is done. So I think it's important to step back and say, what is democracy? Uh, democracy uh, is this method whereby we cannot say that any voter is a deplorable. Uh, there is an equality of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, uh, citizenship 
And all power can be recalled from an international organization, an IO, should there be a wish to do so. So leaving the EU is fully legitimate. It's leaving an international organization. Is it possible? That's another question, because it's so intricate now, interdependent. But um, I come from a country where I'm one of the EU supporters, uh, but uh, we have 80% of public opinion against membership in Norway and we manage quite well outside the EU. So this is easy to forget, and referenda are legitimate methods of deciding important matters. One could say that uh, in membership questions of this kind, it is normal to have a referendum. And then, of course, it's very, very difficult to uh, have a good political process around referenda, but that's another question. Uh, and the EU, really has problems with some parts of its, uh, its the Lisbon Treaty. We touched on that in the debate yesterday, uh, especially the European Parliament, which is now targeted by right, uh, sort of, uh, by this populist group of countries, uh, if we want to call them that, not populist group, that's not right, but targeted for reform, at least, in the EP elections. And that's an important, uh, uh, important uh, issue. So there is a legitimate criticism of the EU in terms of uh, democratic uh, ability. Uh, so there, there is something now that the, the old left of Europe used to be critical of the EU, and now the, the left of Europe is extremely pro-EU because uh, sort of the criticism seems to come from populist right-wing parties. Now, is there, uh, so there, we must be very careful about sort of uh, not throwing out democracy in the, in the discussion about this. Because the issues that mobilize voters, also populist, populist parties, are legitimate and rational ones. The EU and migration must be dealt with in an international, uh, with an international policy, but migration is not refugee policy Refugee policy has its own convention, which also needs improvement, uh, but it has a certain kind of, of, uh, of policy uh, installed already through the UNHCR. So, I mean, migration policy today and refugee policy must re be reformed, uh, but we cannot expect states to accept uh, a supranational EU policy in the area. And globalization impacts unevenly, and we've seen that uh, more clearly, and that's quite rational. If I'm a working class person losing my job, I want my state to work for my kind of job. I don't want to accept that elites, in a way, can, can uh, benefit. So, is there then, yes, we have populism as a problem in European states, in most European states, uh, do we have nationalism as a problem in Europe? Uh, I think uh, I was just reading our conclusions, uh, the text here, the proposed text, and it's very good on exactly this. Aggressive nationalism is uh, not a problem in Europe today, apart from Russian Europe, if you will. There is no belligerence, aggressive nationalism, uh, but there is perhaps a nativism or a very thick nationalism in some places, but it's not prone to aggression at all. And one could argue that the lack of national identity in Western Europe, uh, in the West of, of Europe, is maybe a problem. I have four children and three, one of them is married and living in Norway. The three others are globetrotting and working and traveling and they are you know, they are extremely uh, sort of like world citizens, but there is nothing called a world citizen. Citizenship is national. Uh, you pay your taxes and you do your conscription or whatever. You are deeply embedded in national democracy. So this is, uh, I think, a, a key issue. People want to, ref to find their national community. Uh, and we talked about how nations are natural uh, in, in the sense of evolving, and uh, this is difficult in a global age of so much uh, internet, uh, uh, in a way, I I internet use. 
So I don't think nationalism is a problem so much in Europe. It is distinctly a problem in um, uh, China with, uh, I mentioned an example of the new app that all workers have to, to, to spend much time on and get points using called Study the Great Nation. How uh, the party has made an app whereby you see patriot, you see lots of uh, films and you answer questions about the greatness of China, China's history and the Chinese nation. And unless you do enough work and get enough points, you are then disqualified. Russia undoubtedly has quite a typical old-fashioned uh, kind of nationalism, nation building for the sake of being strong uh, in a warlike manner. Uh, but uh, in uh, Europe, it is more the sort of nas the nation, what is that? And of course, it is not, it is not ethnic, it is something that uh, is a solidaristic community in a way, but it is almost a foreign concept for many young people, the nation. Why must I belong to uh, this nation where I have my passport? Uh, and of course, the tragedy of globalization is that the economy is really global. Internet is, of course, global. Politics and law remain wedding wedded to state sovereignty and states. What uh, and populism uh, is very problematic as a method because uh, the traditional indirect democracy uh, is broke, breaking down easily and you get also uh, this factor of uh, racing to the bottom of being a strict, who can be stricter than me in, for instance, uh, the key issue of migration. As I mentioned, the Social Democrats in Denmark now <laughs> look like the Danish People's Party in, in order to attract votes. So this becomes also very populist in the sense that immediately when uh, an issue is a defining one, all the parties throw themselves at the issue, racing to the bottom and being tough or being open or whatever. Now the last part of my presentation uh, is this identity politics. What is this? This is something uh, I experience quite a lot in, in my country. It is something well known to uh, Americans and Brits. And uh, it is uh, to start with the sort of political science concerns about this. Uh, I quote uh, Francis Fukuyama's uh, recent book called Identity, the demand for dignity and the politics of resentment. And he says, now what has happened? Citizenship, equal equality as human beings, as political subjects, has become instead more and more of group identity politics, starting with gender feminism uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, I remember that from Holy See delegations in Beijing and so on. There was something new, not sex anymore, women and men, but something called gender, which was then constructed, socially constructed, could be deconstructed, could be changed. Of course, sex roles are changeable. So there is some element of empirics to this. But it, this development has become more and more absurd, I think, with time. So we have now no, the old feminism, which we all favor, is a, is, was a, a quest for equality. That men and women, black and white, uh, you know, all uh, attributes of the human being, as Aristotle would call them, call them they wouldn't matter. We would not be discriminated against based on sex or color. So this is exactly right. This is democratic development. But this current uh, movement is the opposite, is the politics of difference. Uh, for instance, the Laplanders of Norway living up in the, in the high north, they are a different people than we are. They have a uh, different language and so on. So when they say, uh, you cannot, we are cit citizens of Norway, all of us, but they would say you are not a Sami or a Laplander, so you are not entitled to have any opinion on anything we stand for. You can't criticize us. Or you're a man, you can't criticize me as a woman because only women know how it is to be women and only women can have an opinion on abortion, for instance, and so on and so forth. And uh, in Sweden there are some kindergartens where 
uh, you cannot say he or she to the children because then you offend the transgender uh, sort of group that say we cannot be essentialist and determine uh, children's uh, sex. That's really old-fashioned biology. Uh, and the political problem with this is, of course, that of tyranny, that you get groups who say, this is not, you cannot speak, if you speak about, if you say something critical about me as a, on abortion, I as a woman feel offended. You offend me, we women determine what it means to be offended, you can't say anything about that because you're a white male, male or a, you're a male, so you can't have an opinion. Uh, therefore, you must adapt to our definition of reality. And this is, of course, the Marxist uh, kind of power analysis. The class, working class, only can know what working class means. Now, this sounds uh, like a, a strange thing, uh, but uh, uh, it is a fact that we have a lot of what is called political correctness in uh, the power of political correctness about these matters is quite, quite important in uh, uh, Western Europe. And I will just end by citing what Francis Fukuyama's book concludes. Uh, and he says that uh, uh, this, uh, the left began to embrace multiculturalism because it was hard to fight changes to the liberal market economic paradigm. That is thesis that uh, the left, in a way, didn't have an ideological uh, program anymore. And he finds now, by now, that this new tribalism, quote, uh, poses a threat to free speech and to the kind of rational discourse needed to sustain a democracy. The fact that an assertion is offensive to somebody's sense of self-worth is often seen as grounds for silencing the individual who made it. And this is political correctness, uh, he says, and um, uh, we see this in, there are many examples of this, and he says that we must return to uh, 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 the equality of citizenship in order to have sound democracies. Now, this, will, um, this is a Western European phenomenon to a great extent, and it is something that divides East and West uh, very much in today's Europe. This is where Orban and these others say we will not have any of this kind of development. So this, the conclusion is, in a way, uh, to address these issues and uh, regarding international politics, it is to look more critically at the EU and, uh, and, democ and democratic accountability. Because right now, the tendency is to take power back to the national level. Thank you.